Good afternoon, um, or if you're watching from China, um, uh, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Scott Roselle. I'm the faculty co-director of SKY. That's the Stanford Center on China's Economy and Institutions. And for those who don't, don't know us, SKY is Stanford's home for empirical data-based uh, multidisciplinary research on China's economy and institutions. Uh, we really aim to foster path-breaking research and create a transformative student experience as well as uh, advanced sort of the public understanding of China, China's relationship with the US and the rest of the world, um, really to try to, uh, to, to create a foundation so people can move forward on, on a deeper sort of more uh, fact-based basis. And uh, um, so what are we doing here today? <laughs> we are very pleased to um, offer this Spotlight speaker event. Uh, the goal of Spotlight series is to host talks bringing the real latest of China research, of the research I just talked about, and insights uh, to the Stanford staff, to our alumni, to our students, uh, and friends around the world. Um, and uh, today's discussion is being recorded. You know, if you have to jump off early or if you got a friend you want to hear, hear this, uh, um, uh, it's going to be available on our website next week. Okay. And so with that, let me introduce today's speaker. Uh, I'm, you know, very, very, um, uh, uh, you know, happy to introduce uh, Professor uh, Yasheng Huang. I've known Yasheng for many, many years. Uh, he's, he's just a, a, a very top of the line um, scholar uh, in this area. Uh, Yasheng Huang is the Epic Foundation Professor of International Management. Uh, professor of Global Economics and Management and Faculty Director of Action Learning at the Sloan School of Management in uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, sort of the Stanford of the East. You guys know that, right? <laughs> uh, he's currently uh, involved in research projects in, in three broad areas. He, he works on the political economy of contemporary China. Uh, he looks at historical, technological, and political developments in China and as a co-PI, uh, food safety in China, the systematic risk management approach. Um, and this is supported by Walmart Foundation. So um, uh, the, yeah, he, he covers a, a whole broad <laughs> set of issues. Uh, he's published numerous articles in the top academic journals um, and media, and he has 11 books in English and Chinese. His book, The Rise and Fall of the East, uh, examination, Autocracy, Stability, Technology in China's History and Today will be published by Yale University Press in 2023. That's right around the corner. <laughs> okay. So um, today, Yasheng is going to talk for about 30 minutes um, on his research on U.S.-China relations in this age of uncertainty. Uh, it couldn't be a more appropriate time. Um, and then we're going to have questions from the audience, and it's going to be back and forth that you're your time to go uh, talk to Yasheng. Um, so please type your questions into the Q&A at any time. So without further delay, uh, Yasheng, uh, the floor is yours. And I'm uh, going to be taking notes and asking you questions, OK? Thank you, uh, Scott. Thank you, Hongbin. I really admire the work you are doing at Stanford, the creation of this center. I have participated in a number of events organized by your center and they are just incredibly rich and impactful and they bring academic research to policy issues and this is something that we sorely need in this age of um, disruption uncertainty so uh, before i uh, go there let me let me share my screen i prepared a simple presentation you know it's not a very detailed presentation it's really more uh, a, a, a way for me to organize uh, my thoughts and ideas. Okay, so, so the title is U.S.-China Relations in the Age of uh, Uncertainty. Uh, Scott is extremely kind to say that uh, I'm gonna present my, my research. Uh, let, let me say that my uh, academic research is not really on U.S.-China relations. I have written, media pieces on the side, 
uh, but this is not my core academic research. I, I uh, since the Trump administration, I have thought increasingly thought more about this issue, and I have introduced these topics into my courses. Uh, for example, this year, for for the first time at the business school, I began to teach about geopolitics, something that um, we we didn't have uh, before. Um, in the book that uh, Scott mentioned, uh, the rise and the fall of the East, East stands for examination, autocracy, stability, and technology. I go back to history. I focus on the contemporary period, but I also speculate about the future. So in that speculation, I do have a section of a chapter on US-China relations. So it's not research in, in, a, in a sense, it's data-driven, uh, empirical and factual. It is speculative and idea-driven. So that's very much the spirit of my presentation today. Um, uh, so the final chapter is prescriptive, um, uh, including ideas on US-China relations. So let me begin by talking about the fundamentals, right? The fundamentals of the US-China uh, relations. And I kind of divide the fundamentals into two categories, the economic fundamentals and the political fundamentals. The, I believe that the two countries share extremely positive economic fundamentals, right? In many ways that you can define what fundamentals mean. If we look at, for example, innovations vis-a-vis -vis applications market and product scaling, I think China is catching up in terms of innovations, inventions, it is still the case that US is the powerhouse, but China has huge potentials in terms of applications of innovations and inventions. Uh, I'm an uh, I'm a, uh, independent board director of a company that, uh, that has come up with really breakthrough technology. And there are not many countries in the world that can scale. Uh, U.S. is one of them, but China is another, right? And U.S. because of policy issues, and it's actually very difficult to scale technology. China is an ideal place to scale technology. The iPhone that we all have was scaled in China, as, uh, uh, as there are other product examples. If you look at the government spending on R&D, the two countries complement with each other. In terms of the size of the government spending, uh, if you look at the US uh, spending on R&D by the government, uh, adjusted for inflation, it has not really increased uh, for the last 20 years. And relative to the GDP, it has fallen substantially relative to the 1960s. China has increased spending on R&D dramatically. China is considered as a upper middle income country. It spends more than 2% of its GDP on, on R&D. It spends more than Japan, spends about comparable level as a European Union. It spends slightly less as compared with the United States, right? So, so this kind of massive spending on science and technology in, in, a, in, in a way complemented the shortcoming of the US for not having spent as much on R&D as they should. But more subtly, if you look at the structure of the government spending by US and by China, US spending is very concentrated. So if you look at top three fields in which the, uh, the uh, of the US uh, government spending on R&D, they, account for something like 77% of the total spending. Whereas the Chinese spending is more diffused. So that means that there are many areas where the US scientists can collaborate with the Chinese scientists in areas that are not being supported by the US government uh, uh, expenditure on R&D. 
especially in material science, in mechanical engineering. China actually spends a lot of money on those. The US spends a lot of money on life science and algorithm, right? So these two sectors account for a large share of the uh, US spending R&D. China spends money more evenly across different sectors. If you look at academic uh, uh, collaborations, there has been a complementarity between uh, kind of what I call in my book, Republic of Government, where the government takes the lead, government uh, spends money proactively, and Republic of Science. And this is a famous idea proposed by Michael Polanyi in the 1962 article, in which he talks about academic research being driven by collaborations, by academic freedom. But you can have all the collaborations you want, all the uh, uh, freedom you want, but science is extremely expensive. You need the government. So to some extent, you can argue that Chinese government is playing this missing role by the US government in the past for not having spent heavily on R&D. Uh, the other thing about science, doing science, is that science is actually very labor intensive, right? The laboratories uh, 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 have technicians, research assistants, postdocs, right? Social science is actually not that labor intensive, right? So a social science article can be co-authored by, you know, three people, four people, but a science article can be co-authored by 20 scientists by 20 uh, uh, students, by, by, it's done by a team, right? China has a huge advantage in terms of the, the scale of the human capital, right? If you look at the college students, if you look at the PhD students, right? The scale is very large, right? Some people question the quality, but, but the issue is that if the base is very large, if, even if the ratio is, is small, because of the large base, you still have a large absolute number. So if you shut down the Chinese students from uh, coming to the United States, many of the laboratories at Stanford, at, at MIT would have to be shut down as well, right? Doing science is extremely labor intensive and China complements the United States in that way. If we come down to the economic level, uh, there's also complementarity in terms of, I already mentioned scaling the technology in China. China has a very advanced manufacturing. It is not just because of the low labor cost. Right? Many people say, oh, it's a labor cost and even exploitation, and there, there's that. But that's actually not the main factor. The main factor is that China has a very efficient clustering of manufacturing operations, right? It is that cluster that has reduced the cost of manufacturing. US has very advanced research clusters, right? In Silicon Valley and now in Kendall Square in terms of life science. But US doesn't really have manufacturing clustering. So it needs another manufacturing clustering to scale the products, to produce the manufactured products. And this, this is where China has a advantage. Well, then we ask the question, what went wrong? And this gets to the politics, right? Essentially, the political fundamentals are bad and deteriorating. Right, rapidly, um, you know, I would say in the last five years for sure, but also probably in the last 10 years. And, and it's not just that you have bad political fundamentals. It is also the failure to address proactively the political fundamentals. So let me, let me limit my comments to the United States. I won't comment on China, um, uh, sort of Chinese policy toward the United States. Let me just talk about US policy toward China. That's in part because I live in the United States. 
Uh, I was born in China, but I live in the United States and also US is a democracy. So what we say here potentially can, uh, can, have, can have some uh, influence, uh, hopefully. Uh, so I will just limit my comments to the US side of the equation. So there has been this substantial failure on the part of the United States to address the political fundamentals. If we look back to the 1990s, right, and the, there were debates about the most favored nation trading status, and then there were debates about the uh, WTO, it's very interesting that, uh, that, that trade, you know, academics kind of talk about trade in economic terms. Politicians talk about trade with China in political terms, right? If you go back to uh, President Clinton, you know why he advocated permanent um, trading status for China. The overwhelming argument was political rather than economic, right? So how trade and foreign investments would engage with the Chinese, would promote democracy and, and things like that. The rationale was political, at least by politicians. But, but here's the problem. When you look at uh, back uh, at, at that period of history, US never really had an explicit political strategy towards China. It had goals, right? And a kind of belief that economics automatically will change China. So you actually don't need a proactive political strategy. Without the political strategy, uh, compounding the fact that, that US didn't have a political strategy is the fact that US had incredibly unrealistic and grandiose uh, aspirations. Democracy, you know, human rights, rule of law, right? So kind of trade, investment, and suddenly you have democracy, rule of law, and human rights on the other side. Right, so exactly how you work from trade to uh, democracy, human rights, and rule of law, that is almost left to magic, right? So there's very little hard thinking about how to link one with the other. And so, you know, these grand goals aside, the US has systematically ignored kind of a small uh, changes, uh, what I call nudges, that may not appear to be very impressive at, at a given point in time, but cumulatively, I believe that uh, they can lead to meaningful flexibilities in the Chinese system down the road, right? So the US completely ignored these small things Right, setting the goal very, very high without a strategy to implement how to accomplish the goal. So that's kind of my one page PPT critique of the US engagement policy uh, since the early 1990s. So let me kind of cite some examples. Right, so one example is that US has systematically ignored the principle of symmetry. Um, if you look at academic uh, collaborations, and I personally support engaging with Chinese academics, engaging with uh, uh, Chinese uh, students, um, and I think Trump administration's China initiative was extremely counterproductive. Uh, actually, personally, I have worked on, on, on that. We founded an organization, nationwide organization called the Asian American Scholar Forum in the wake of the arrest of Professor Gang Chen at, uh, at MIT. So I, I support open science. I support academic exchange with China. Uh, and I even support Confucius Institutes to operate on US campus. But with a condition, the condition is that 
At the same time, U.S. should have demanded unfettered access by U.S. scholars to China, right? It could be social scientists, it could be economists, sociologists, law school professors, political scientists, or it could be scientists and technologists, right? So it should be, you know, not, not maybe at the same level of access, but at least the U.S. should kind of monitor the development there and, and, and not to uh, uh, sort of let uh, a, symmet a, a, a symmetrical situation get out of hand too much, right? So by the time, uh, by now, the level of access has become extremely uneven. In terms of media, right? So I think the US should have demanded the same access to China by New York Times, Google, right? Exactly the same access by China Daily and Baidu to the United States. You know, I don't know about Stanford, but when I walk on uh, our campus, I can pick up people's daily very easily. I can pick up China Daily very easily and actually <laughs> free of charge. Uh, um, and I can use Baidu very easily, right? So, I, you know, we're, dem we're not demanding more. It's just the same treatment, right? And US didn't do that for many, many years. In terms of business, right? You know, let me give you the example of uh, cloud computing, right? Alibaba has two cloud computing centers in the United States, wholly owned by Alibaba. You know, they don't really have a big market because there's, the, 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 there's lack of trust, uh, but they can operate you know, free of uh, uh, equity restrictions and, uh, and data restrictions. Why not demanding exactly the same treatment uh, that, uh, that Alibaba has in the United States to Google and Amazon's cloud computing operations in China, right? Exactly the same thing, exactly the same thing, nothing more. And you know, even if it is a little bit less, that's okay, but nothing more, right? So I believe those demands are reasonable and uh, are justified and they don't have to happen by kind of moralistic, imperialistic um, uh, mandate, right? Uh, but for years and years, uh, US uh, didn't quite go there. You know, there's a very influential book by uh, Robert Axelrod. Uh, it's called The Evolution of Cooperation. What he proved through computer simulations and, and, and algorithms is that tit for tat is the best strategy to get cooperation from the other side, right? So you do A to see if B uh, reciprocates. If B, uh, uh, sorry, you do A and to see if the other side also does A. If they don't do A, then you withdraw, B, uh, withdraw A, right? That over a period of time has proven to be the best strategy to get the other side to cooperate. And US has not done that. And the other issue that I have with sort of what's going on in Washington DC is there are just too many grand strategies and too few fixes, right? So if you look at kind of prevailing narratives on, on China, oh, the long game, the Thucydides trap, the full spectrum competitor, the 100 year marathon, strategic competitor, all these kind of grand ideas. Now, I, I think doing some of that is okay. But I think it's not, it's not productive to stay at that level. So I would advocate a different strategy, maybe complementary to the grand strategy, which is can we adopt a bottom-up approach and apply fixes to our existing relationship with China, right? So take the existing relationship as a given, look 
where it has worked out well and where it has not worked out well and apply fixes, right? Rather than kind of apply a grand strategy and redesign the whole relationship from the scratch. I, I would advocate, you know, doing four things. One is seeking symmetry, right? That's the previous uh, slide. The second is kind of, you don't need to deal with US-China relationship purely using a China specific approach. And I'm going to elaborate on that a little bit more. Start hard conversations with China, but with you know, humility and um, mutually acceptable grounds, right? So rather than lecturing and, and, and from high grounds, right? You know, take the other side's perspective, perspective and then turn the conversation on those terms, right? I'm gonna elaborate a little bit more. And we really need to invest in our knowledge base uh, about China. This is why I'm so happy that Scott and Hongbin have created this center. And I, and I really feel that uh, that kind of center of gravity, kind of really interesting policy work coupled with serious academic research is moving to the West Coast, right? Stanford and UCSD, also, they have an excellent center on China. Uh, I, I really congratulate uh, Scott and, and Hongbin. So let, let me talk about the kind of approach that doesn't require a China specific approach. Let me give the example of the uh, PCAOB, the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, right? So that was passed uh, 10 years ago, uh, a provision that requires uh, uh, auditing by the PAC, uh, PCAOB of the auditing firms that audit the books of the companies that are listed in the United States, right? So this is not a China specific law. It applies to US companies, it applies to other foreign uh, companies and other foreign countries. For some reason, for 10 years, this was not enforced on China, right? Um, and, and I applaud Biden administration for insisting on enforcing this provision on China. And I'm very happy to, uh, to learn that China at least has signaled its willingness to comply with the uh, uh, PCAOB, right? So, you know, that's a, I think that's a productive approach, right? Work on something very specific and something that's not invented specifically for China. Let me give another example, right? Which is the CFIUS, the uh, government agency in the United States that is in charge of reviewing foreign investment projects in the United States. The Congress is now telling CFIUS to be strict on Chinese investments, right? My own view is that there's a better approach. The approach is that you can design the level of scrutiny by CFIUS according to how the investments, the US investments are being treated in the relevant home country, right? So, so essentially my suggestion is that CFIUS should take into account how China treats US investments in China, right? How India treats US investments in India, how Japan treats US investment in Japan as one of many criteria, right? Not, not just one criterion, but uh, as one of many, many criteria, right? That's not singling out China. That, that I believe has a bigger impact in terms of uh, changing the investment uh, environment and climate in China. It has a better hope of doing that rather than thinking narrowly to restrict US investments 
in the United States, uh, Chinese investments in the United States. You know, there are parameters that um, CFIUS can consider in the home country, right? In this case, China, investor protection, uh, regulatory transparency, data sovereignty, the degree of national risk, uh, security restrictions, right? So I think, you know, it's a fair game to consider how China treats US companies along these uh, uh, criteria uh, and then apply these criteria to look at Chinese investments in the United States. Again, we apply the Axelrod principle, right? Tit for tat, nothing more, right? Even if it is a little bit less, that's okay, but nothing more. On human rights, right? I don't think US should give up on its values, right? So US is a democracy. Human rights has a very long tradition in the United States. US shouldn't give up on human rights, but US should engage with China on terms acceptable to both sides, right, it, it, uh, on, on human rights. Let me give you an example, right? Last year, when the Chinese delegation met with the US delegation in Alaska, the Chinese side launched a very long lecture criticizing the US human rights record. And the US pushed back and say, you know, it's, it's uh, hypocritical uh, and then US uh, pushed back. And people in the media kind of laughed at uh, Chinese uh, criticism. I, I, I have a different view, right? I think what the US government should have done right at that moment is to accept the criticisms and then declare that, okay, by criticizing the US, China has agreed that human rights is a legitimate issue in the bilateral relationship between China and the United States. Right? Secretary Blinken and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan completely missed that. Right? They completely missed that when China was criticizing US human rights record, China made a huge concession, which is that Actually, human rights are a legitimate area of discussion. The previous policy of China was human rights are domestic issues. It's not subject to foreign policy. China actually made a concession right there, right? That was completely missed by, uh, by Secretary Blinken and, uh, and National Security uh, Jake Sullivan. And the, the, the dialogues with China on human rights should not be sanctimonious, sanctimonious, right? You know, US often talks about universality of values of rights and freedom. Let's look at the facts. In 2020, 74 million Americans voted for a transparent authoritarian, right? Democracy is not even a national value in the United States, let alone a universal value. I just, I just don't think that that's the right way to start a conversation on human rights, on something that, that, is, that, that is not necessarily universally accepted. You know, I cherish, I personally believe in those values. I personally cherish those values, but I can also understand that there are many people in the world who do not necessarily take it for granted that these values are universal. I think a case for democracy should be based on performance, not on values, right? There has been recent social science research that documents the performance benefits of democracy, right? So a, a conversation on human rights, on democracy should be based on performance rather than on values. We should also find the language that can resonate with the Chinese, you know, maybe Chinese elites, Chinese public, young people in China, Chinese intellectuals, right? And in my own little effort, I have tried to do that, but nobody paid attention. 
uh, in a foreign policy article a few years ago, I wrote the uh, article arguing exactly that point, staying away from this kind of a abstract universal value argument, focus on tangible benefits. In another foreign policy article I advocated, when we talk about human rights, when we talk about democracy, we should think about a language that works with the main street in China. Let me give you another example. The best messenger of democracy was actually Ambassador Gary Locke, right? A Chinese American appointed by President Obama as the ambassador to China. You know, he went to the airport to board the plane to China. He uh, picked up a cup of coffee from a Starbucks. And that picture went viral in China. An ambassador with a backpack picking up a cup of coffee. That was the best message. You know, the fact that he's Chinese also helped. That's the best message that delivered the idea that democracy is egalitarian, that democracy treats people in the same way. Let me end by talking about the need to invest in our knowledge base. US has, US has failed to invest not only in science and technology, but also in social science. The social science funding of the National Science Foundation has been cut dramatically. There's almost no support from the NSF for social science research that is not connected to the United States. And I'm talking about this as, as someone who has been rejected many times by NSF. US is spending less money on area studies than during the Cold War. I, I think Scott, if I'm, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I think you, you have the same, uh, same view on this. And then there's another development, which is the harmful effect of um, kind of a discipline uh, on social science, right? So uh, kind of social science as a science, rather than as a area of knowledge to discover uh, uh, history, uh, human affairs in a different civilization, right? So funding agencies and social science journals, they don't attach value to discovery and phenomenally driven studies. And the US government has very little real China expertise. Um, I also believe that we should kind of break through this, what I call path type casting in the policy community, right? So there's kind of a pro-China people and anti-China people. Um, the debates are about priors and judgments. I think this is very harmful and unproductive. This is not a very good way to generate ideas. I think I, I'm gonna end on the same point that Scott started. We need database, factual, analytical discussions on China, right? rather than kind of just judgments and subjective uh, values. Thank you very much. Yashan, that was, that was fantastic. Uh, Hongbin and I on our little insert, internal chat um, back and forth with each other kept saying, oh my gosh, that's, you know, that's, a, that's exactly what, what we say or uh, wow, that is said so perfectly. I mean, we, we, we've had uh, six or seven of these spotlights and this is the first time that uh, we, we couldn't, uh, it, was, it was really good. You hit on so many, so many hard points. Uh, points, some of them are controversial. Some of them are pushing forward. Some of them are saying, you know, why didn't we do this 15 years ago or something like that? And um, so, um, um, I'd like to open it up now to the to the audience. Remember, type your uh, questions into Q and A. I mean, there there has to be questions out there, and in fact, there already are. Um, and some of them were asked early in your talk, so um, uh, I'm I'm going to ask them anyhow, <laughs> and uh, uh, then uh, you you can just say I said that, <laughs> and 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 we can go on. Um, the the first one is. Um, 
do you think if if we tried symmetry now, <laughs> um, do you think whether China will grant those access if the U.S. asks? Um, and then it's combined. The second question um, is much of what you said sounds like rec reciprocity. Uh, why don't you use that term? And I heard you use tit for tat. Uh, but uh, uh, so those are the first two questions and then then we'll go on. There's, there's actually a subtle difference between reciprocity and symmetry. Reciprocity is, is that it's kind of like a trade, right? So I give you something, I give you A, you gave me B, right? So it, it's, I, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about exactly the same treatments simultaneously uh, uh, created and established. I think it's a fair question whether or not China would agree today if we try this approach, because the, the kind of the, the larger atmosphere is not a very good one now, right? And I will argue that that we should have done this 10 years ago, 15 years ago, maybe even 20 years ago, it would have been. Let, let, let me put it this way. If we don't really know whether or not, even if we did these things 10 years ago, they would have worked. But we would never know now because we never tried it. Uh, and so, so that's the problem that I have. And I think today is very hard, but I would argue today they are still room to think creatively. Uh, for example, you know, um, I've written about Ukraine and, and I do believe that, uh, that, 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 that China can play a, a productive role. And then I, I think China actually has not been given, given some credit for, I mean, the, the Chinese rhetoric is pro-Russia or lack of critical rhetoric on Russia, that's true. But the simple fact is that uh, at this point, there's no evidence that China is supporting Russia in terms of military aid, uh, in terms of the special, special economic assistance provided to Russia to compensate for the Western sanctions, right? There's no evidence of that. And I, and I, and I think that that should be highlighted, that should be acknowledged. And I believe there, there's probably some reciprocity, right? So if, if China helps, the West on, on Ukraine, maybe we should deal with trade barriers, we should deal with uh, tariffs, right? US itself is suffering from inflation, so uh, keeping these tariffs on is terribly bad for the US, right? It's not good for China, it's not, it's not good for the United States. And, and the US should be more proactively seeking linkage between these issues more than uh, it did before. Whether or not it works, I don't know, but, but we have to try to see if it works or not. It's better than doing nothing. That, that's my point of view. Yeah, yes, and uh, nothing has sort of been uh, the, 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 the policy so far. Um, an, another question uh, from a, um, a friend of ours from Canada that says, uh, the approach you propose is based on the assumption that the US wants to have normal relations with China. Uh, would it work if the goal of the U.S.-China is actually to contain the rise of China, or, or um, et cetera, et cetera? So, um, um. see, see, there, I, I think during the Trump administration, definitely containing China was 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 a was a very important strategic objective. Pompeo and, and people like him. I don't believe that the U.S as a whole, right? If you look at since the early 1990s, the policy has been containing China. I think the US has, a, we can criticize the US for its naivete, which is that we engage with China, and, and Obama actually said this explicitly, we accept a strong China on the condition that it is a, it is, um, I mean, he, he probably didn't use democracy, but it is, it is a, cooperative country, something like that, right? So, and I think until Xi Jinping, I could see the case for that. Um, and, and China was getting stronger. 
uh, but China was gradually reforming its system. It had a pragmatic relationship with the, with the West. It preserved the one country, two systems uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, it had a, a long-term uh, vision about Taiwan, right? So I, I, I think during that period of time, we accepted the rise of China as an economic power, as a given, on the condition that China has these pragmatic foreign policy goals vis-a-vis -vis the United States and vis-a-vis -vis, uh, other regions in the world, right? So I think that has changed fundamentally. And so what you don't want is a stronger China and a China that is um, uh, antagonistic uh, toward, the, uh, toward the West. You know, there's a deeper question, what is a chicken, what is the egg? Um, I think that's a debatable, uh, that should be debated, you know, whether China made the first move or the US made the first move in antagonizing the other side. Um, but but, but if, if we refuse to see the difference between the current leadership in China and the past leadership in China, I, I, I don't think that we are being objective. There are differences. Yes. Um... Uh, I, I guess you just sort of uh, uh, started the first step. Um, there's a similar question about the U.S. So he said, uh, somebody asked, uh, the focus seems to be on who's in the White House in your talk. Um, the negative rhetoric, however, this person says, is um, in part or, or mostly driven by this part, bipartisan agreement on Congress that China is to be feared and controlled. Um, does your approach apply to Congress? Um, how do yeah. you handle that? So I, let, me, let me just say from the outset, I think a lot of the rhetoric from the Congress is extremely uh, counterproductive. Um, I, I, you know, I, I guess I'm kind of in between, right? So I, I don't believe that uh, uh, I don't believe that containment is the right strategy. On the other hand, I also believe that, uh, that there are legitimate issues between China and the United States. There are legitimate human rights issues, there are legitimate national security issues, there are legitimate economic issues. We, we cannot possibly uh, live in a world where we ignore these legitimate issues, right? How to resolve them is the, the key matter, right? So China in, initiative is extremely unproductive. Trade war is extremely unproductive. The issue is whether or not there's an alternative. The alternative is kind of seeking symmetry or seeking reciprocity if, if, if that's a better word, right? So I believe that's a, that's a better way to go, right? For example, Confucius Institute. The US government applies pressures to universities to close down Confucius Institutes. I, 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 I think that's, that's not wise, right? So we can go to the Chinese government and say, okay, Confucius Institute can operate, but can we establish, you know, rule of law center, you know, something like that, right? The economic center or political science center, sociology center at Fudan University, right? I will prefer that approach. At least I will prefer that approach first, right? If Chinese government doesn't agree, then we apply pressures to, um, to, uh, uh, to get rid of uh, Confucius uh, uh, Institute. I don't fear, I mean, I, I have sufficient faith in democracy. I don't fear ideology from China. And I welcome the ideology, I welcome debate with people who believe in that ideology. I don't have that fear. So to have a Confucius Institute on, or well, MIT doesn't have one, but on my campus, I, I have no fear, right? Um, and as long as it operates within the rules. So that will be my preference, how to deal with this issue. Yeah, yes. Um, uh, if you look at some of our sky briefs, we've talked about these Confucius Institutes and this, it, 
is not a systematic <laughs> propaganda tool of China. <laughs> uh, it does a lot of good, actually. It teaches you, uh, you language know. and culture, right? So, yeah. yeah. I mean, then um, there's another question right here that um, uh, addresses exactly some of the things you say. And uh, the, uh, the question asker, asker <laughs> says, you are right that the discourse on China has been increasingly either bashers or apologists on the extremes. This is also uh, in the case of journals and mainstream media. Um, is it possible to publish data-based articles which you do try to bridge this divide with uh, evidence, uh, with data-based uh, analysis? So uh, uh, can this help? No, I, I, <laughs> I actually don't, I'm not worried about academic journals. Right. So academic journals publish the what the data say. And you know, for example, we have a paper that shows that uh, in the last 10 years, the regulatory transparency on food safety has increased dramatically. Uh, and, and food safety itself has improved, right? So we say what the data tell us. That's that I think that's. In, in the U.S. Uh, academia, we present these findings, and nobody <laughs> would arrest us for saying these things. I don't worry about academia. I, I worry about policy community. I worry about um, uh, media to some extent, uh, and, and you know, I don't blame media. I, I media media by its nature tends to be negative, right? So it's negative, not just on China, it's negative on the United States itself, it's negative on Japan, it's negative on, on, on Britain, it's negative on France. So that's just the nature of things. But here's the difference between, okay, so if you're average an Ameri uh, average American, you read two articles, both are negative. One is about US, the other is about China. The question here is, does this average American, uh, uh, is he impacted in exactly the same way by these two articles? My answer is no, because when that average American reads an article about America, he or she has other sources of information about America, right? So he go out and do some shopping, he gets information about that, right? He you know, reads a book about America, he gets information from that. Whereas the article about China is the only article he or she has read about China. That forms the totality of the impression on this person. So, so again, this is not the fault of the media. This is just, you know, when you're an American, you are more knowledgeable about, about your own country than about China. So Scott, my view is that we as academics have an obligation to provide other sources of information, not to compete with the media, but at least to, to provide additional sources of information. Sometimes that information can be very critical of China. That's, that's totally fine. Um, so so that, that's my argument, right? So it, rather than bashing media, uh, we, we should do our share. And, and the, the, the work that you're doing uh, at Stanford is exactly uh, doing that. Uh, it's providing another narrative, it's providing facts, it's providing data. The, uh, the event you hosted with uh, Yi Qing and uh, Jennifer, uh, fantastic, right? Survey data research, and, and, and I hope uh, journalists can, can uh, participate in some of these events. That's terrific. I, I agree with everything that you, you say. I think uh, what we're doing and what you're doing with uh, is trying to take some of that academic research and make it more uh, accessible. And I think we need to do that and, uh, and do it more. Um, there's uh, about, there's so many questions here. Uh, I'm going to take three and combine them together. They're about decoupling. Um, and uh, it's sort of, I'll let you take away. If U.S. and China would decouple, will U.S. economy function at all? It seems the U.S. embarking on decoupling with China. Is the trend of disengagement inevitable? 
Um, and um, uh, is it politically um, uh, the only path forward? Um, so what, what do you think about that? Those are three different questions. Yeah, so they are all about decoupling. So maybe I can sort of combine the uh, uh, answers to, to, to one. I mean, decoupling is, is already happening, right? So the two countries are not decoupled, but they are decoupling um, and in the process of decoupling. You know, obviously the pandemic didn't help. Um, and, uh, and, and, and this is where I really worry about Ukraine, right? So essentially decoupling can be a collateral damage from, from the war that, that really doesn't have much to do with China. Um, but then if you have the secondary sanctions on China, that's going to further the decoupling process that is already going on. The zero COVID policy is not helpful, right? And locking down Shanghai in this manner, my worry is that it is going to diminish the credibility of China as a reliable supplier of uh, products uh, to the rest of the world. And, you know, so, it, it's 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 um, the 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 thing that 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 decouples countries are not incremental things, but are shocks, right? When a shock happens, everybody is doing exactly the same thing, rather than one person doing one thing and other people kind of wait around. When you have this kind of extreme lockdown, right? Uh, that's essentially is moving and changing the behavior of everybody. Um, so, so that's going to further the decoupling. Whether the US is going to work or not, um, I think global growth is definitely going to suffer from the decoupling, right? So as I said before, the fundamentals of cooperation between China and the US are actually very, very good, right? They complement with each other, they compete with each other, but they also complement each other. You cannot possibly imagine a world where you don't suffer in terms of economic growth when that kind of complementarity goes away. India may rise up and, and replace China, but it's not going to be quick. It's not going to be perfect. Clustering takes time, right? As Scott, as you know, right? Economic research shows that clustering takes time. It, it, it sort of takes a long time. Once it is there, it is going to go like this, right? So Silicon Valley, you know, so clustering takes time. And it took China 30 years to get the cluster uh, ready to go, right? To unwind from that and to recreate another one, that's going to, even if in the end we succeed, it's going to take time. So economic efficiency is going to suffer. Politically, that's going to be a different logic, right? So politicians obviously benefit from uh, decoupling uh, rhetoric, uh, but I do hope that uh, responsible politicians are going to look at facts, right? It, it does nobody any good to lower growth in the United States, to lower growth in China. You know, if academics decouple, the global production of knowledge is going to slow down, right? Th there's no question about it. Uh, all of us are going to be the victims of the decoupling. So by the way, I'm saying this, not just to the US policymakers, but also to the Chinese policymakers. It is very important for China to recognize, yes, it has achieved impressive economic growth, impressive technological development, impressive scientific development. But if you look at academic research, academic research shows that Chinese achieve technological success and scientific uh, accomplishment on the basis of collaborations with the West. On the basis of collaborations with the West. It is not just China doing it alone. China is doing it with, with US, with Europe, with Germany, with Japan, with other countries, right? So, so it is not to the benefit to China to give up on collaborations with the West. So the message is 
both to the US policymakers as well as to the Chinese policymakers. Good. Wow, well, that, uh, uh, that leaves us on a high note. I, I counted um, um, 12 pessimistic notes, but probably 18 optimistic notes in your talk, uh, uh, which doesn't happen much. I, uh, and I mean, I think you gave us some, some uh, sort of handles about some things we can do to push this forward when, when often we've just shrugged our shoulders and, and, and hope for, for whatever. I, I really want to thank you, Yasheng, for making time. I've got, you see me glancing down, I've had 20 WeChat and emails from the audience saying, wow, this was a great spotlight. And, um, and that's certainly uh, uh, true. Uh, again, thank you very much for the timing uh, today. Uh, stay safe. Stay healthy. Uh, we look forward to connecting with you really soon. Uh, thank you, everyone.